All right, good evening. Good evening. It's another uh, time of the year where we um, end up in the education building because uh, the kids are next door in the sanctuary doing their Christmas uh, uh, program practice. And um, today is uh, December 11th of the year 2024. And uh, since it's a Wednesday, we're continuing on in Philippians. And in Philippians, we are looking at chapter 2, and tonight we're going to look at verses 5 through 8. I'll read the, the four scriptures that we're going to look at, and then I'll pray. And tonight, tonight we're going to pray for um, a lady named uh, um, uh, Mary Campbell. My friend Jeremy um, is heading to Arkansas to be with his mom, and um uh, and uh, she she was having some breathing problems. I, yeah, yeah. Respiratory failure. So they're not for sure she'll make it through the night. So yeah. So he. I met him this afternoon about three o'clock, and he said he was going to. Uh, Wait till after five, so he didn't have to drive through Tulsa's traffic. I said that sounds like a plan. So he's he's on his way down there. So we'll pray for his mom, uh, Mary. So here we go, verse five through eight. Here we go. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and the coming in the likeness of man. And he was found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Or the death of a cross, yeah. Oh, the cross. There it is. The death of the cross. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, this time that we can gather in a free country and, 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 and look at your word and, and just have fellowship. And Lord, we ask that you just be with the kids next door. And Lord, we just pray that they have a a good practice. And Lord, we pray for the Christmas program that brings out people. Lord, that uh, your gospel will be clearly presented and people will hear from you. And tonight, Lord, your spirit breathed out this word. And we thank you, Lord. We're under the blood and we can be here <laughs> with, with you and hear from you. And we ask, Lord, that you will speak to us. And we lift up my friend. Jeremy's mother, Mary, Lord, and we ask that you touch her right now and heal her. And Lord, when he gets there, Lord, we pray that, that she can open her eyes and she'll be able to speak to him. And Lord, that they'll have a good meeting. And Lord, you are the healer. So we're asking for her healing. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. amen. All right. So <clears throat> I'm sure Mel would agree. This is probably the heart of this letter it is probably the most important four verses but then the, the next three after that tell you the result of of what it, of, of, of having the name above every name for doing this and um i'll, I'll just tell you guys this i it barely made the notes because i i i was running out of space you can see i i, I scrunched up the titles into this um they believe that this may have been an old hymn, and Paul took it and used it to make his point to the Philippians. And then there's evidence that he might have put a line in there, and I'll show you that at the end. So it's at the end of this. So here we go. Verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So uh, let this mind or... The way Mounts translates this, the word your instead of you, which was also in Christ, he puts that at the front of this verb and puts it, your attitude towards one another should be. <laughs> that's how he translates that. I was like, wow, okay. So that's our Greek scholar. And uh, it's it's a verb, it's present and it's active, but it's also in the, it's the imper, uh, imperative mood. So he's telling them to do this. And uh, the last imperative we saw was, in, um, no, that we saw another one, but he starts using imperatives back in verse 27 of chapter 1. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. That, that's an imperative there. 
So this is the part where he is telling them this is what you do. The subsection that uh, Fee calls this, he calls this as God, he emptied himself. And that th these are going to be verses 5 through 7, but we'll look at 8, which, which is its own little subsection, and we'll talk about that. Some believe that this hymn and the poetry can be seen. There's poetry you can see in it, so there's no way I could do this, but um, Fee puts it all, lines it all in the book, and you can see the stratas of the, of the, of the poem, how they think it went, or the hymn if you will. All right. Paul flows right into the mind that was in Christ with what he was saying to the Philippians to have the same mind. So go back to verse two, two, fulfill my joy in being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the others better than himself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interests of others. Here we are in verse 5. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ. So, so now he's giving them the ultimate example. Who's our ultimate example? It's Jesus, yeah. And that's, and that's what this is doing. It's one of those parts in scriptures is very clear. This imperative, which is the mood of the verb, that's how you know you're, you're being told what to do sums up what he was just saying about thinking a certain way or some translations you know bring it out as a mindset or to have the, or, or to have this attitude that is found in Christ so most of the time attitude has a negative con, uh, um, a negative uh, I can't say the word right now spin to it but uh, you can't have a good attitude amen you can't think, you know what, Jesus died for me, <laughs> and uh, he was willing to do that, you know, all right, I can, I, can, I can help out other people, so, or whatever God's shown you to do. Now, this passage is rich in theology, but especially Christology, all right, so there's a new word for you. It's the word Christ, knowledge, you put together, and it's one of those words that uh, pronunciation changes so it's Christ, Christology Christology so I don't know if that's where the name crystal came from and theologians said hey I like that it's a pretty so they started naming their daughters crystal so I like to think so it's, it's, it's a biblical it's a biblical name see there you go yeah, it's biblical all right yeah there was this girl I knew it back in Bible college her name was crystal I liked her she was cool anyways my cousin's here too with that name all right so, this pa passage is, is, is rich in theology, but especially about who is Jesus. So, you know, who is Jesus? Well, he's the Son of God, right? You know, he came in the form of man. We're going to look at that. Um, he, he, uh, he came in the appearance of a man. Uh, what season are we in? Christmas. Christmas time. Yeah, Merry Christmas. This, this little poem hits all that. It hits every bit of that. It hits, it hits what he was thinking before he became incarnate. And what is that? Becoming a human being. Who was this entity? Who was this deity, you know, person, the, the second person of the Trinity? You know, who was he before he became, you know, the, the, the incarnate? So, so it's rich with that. That speaks of his pre-existence. That's what I was getting at of, of Christ. So for five and six... Everything he's saying, he's saying that this is what Christ was thinking before he became a human being. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So, your world of theology is now, <laughs> you're now engaged in the whole world of theology. Here we go. That he had this mindset before becoming the incarnate. That's what I was saying. Go, go to verse 7. But made himself of no rep uh, reputation taking on the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. That's the incarnation right there. So we'll get to that here in a little bit. And in their, and then also in their community expressed in their community express expressing his, his self expressing his selflessness. That's not selfishness, it's selflessness and humility. And we'll look more at that with the next three verses. For correct behavior, focusing on what? The gospel. 
because the imperative section starts off with, let this, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel, back in 127. So, so um, we're going to see what, what was Jesus thinking before he became human being. All right, this is what he's thinking. He had this mindset. Here we go. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which, oh, sorry, verse 6, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. All right, so who being in, or although he was, is, is how Mouse likes to translate it. It's a participle, it's, it's present and active, so right then and there. In the form of God, did not consider or did not regard, is how Mouse likes that, and it's a verb. It's eris, but now it's in the middle voice, meaning he's doing something to himself. Do you guys realize that Christ went ahead and signed up with the Father's will and said, okay, I'll become human? Yeah, that's what it's getting at. Yeah. I'm going to go down there and do the plan. What's the plan? End up on a cross? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he definitely did it to himself. You know, you can say that. That's what the middle voice means. All right. Being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery. To be, to be is the next uh, little action word. It's just an infinitive, and that is present and active. Presently and actively, the whole time, because I'm going to tell you guys about a, a belief that I don't go for. Uh, the whole time he was divine, amen? This whole time. So being in the form of God and equal with God shows that Christ was the opposite of selfishness to the example of selflessness or to not have selfish ambitions back in verse 3 because back in verse 3 it says let let nothing be done through selfish ambitions or conceit now conceit's interesting because you can translate it empty glory yeah yeah vain glory yeah say it that way yeah well was he glorified for what he did yeah because at the end of this which we'll look at next time um yeah, he was he was uh, given the name above every name, so he is the opposite of everything that 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 you don't want to be. When he brought to them salvation, and um, I liked him when we were studying John, and and we get to the point where he says it is finished. And when he said it is finished, he said it was it, it's done. That's the end. You believe in the cross, you believe in who he is, and, and you believe the message of the cross, you are in. All right. His form is not what was his external, because, you know, theologically, God's spirit, so God doesn't have a body, you know. And since we're in um, the modern time of gender confusion, um, uh, a spirit is asexual. It does not have... Uh, parts of a body so but the bible refers to god as he because he shows power and strength so the bible is not sexist for those modern feminists who are just now getting educated about history um it has to do with uh he and then of course it also has to do with he came as a Man, because he was the perfect sacrifice for sin, and the perfect sacrifice or the sacrifice for sin so far was a male lamb without blemish. Why would you sacrifice a male lamb without blemish? Because that male lamb represents power and strength and the ability to make more sheep, <laughs> you know, perfect good sheep, you know. So, yeah, so it's, it's also fulfilling that. I thought I'd throw that in there. So it doesn't have to do with his external because he's spirit at the moment, right? This is a pre-existence, but it has to do with what the characteristics, the characteristics of being God, or we can say nature. You can use that word too. What is the nature of God? Selflessness. Yeah. What is the nature of God? Humbling yourself. What is the nature of all the great gods? To be capricious and do whatever you want to for your own self. So that's one of the things that makes Christianity crazy and different and radical compared to some religions because it doesn't make sense to them because people think that that the, the deities, uh, the other deities are um, just like them. 
No, we're the ones with the sin nature. God is perfect. And what is he? What is he? His characteristic is humility and selflessness. So there we go. And then also becoming a servant later, right? Back to verse 7. But made himself with no reputation, taking on the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. So we'll get that here in a second. But was not, was not, but, but was not robbery or better, a better translation of that was he did not seize, a lot of, uh, uh, I think it's the, the uh, NIV uses this, did not seize on his advantage of being in, the, in God's <laughs> nature. All right. Have you ever been right? Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever given up your right to be right? Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was right, and he was the only righteous person, and he did not have to go to the cross. So, if you've ever been in that situation, I'm not telling you to compromise on the truth, you know, and something major, you know, and something that has consequences, you know, of, of uh, co copping out on, on something. But, but um, if you ever just were in a conversation and you just kind of agree to disagree with someone, you're just like, Psh. all right, man, it's... Like 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 recently, I, I was you know I, I've I've had I've had several conversations lately with people. I'm like, it's not a salvation issue. So if I'm wrong, I'll still see in heaven, you know. <laughs> Anyways, but I could get all puffed up, which would be sin, you know. And uh, but yeah, I, I do believe in the truth. I do believe we should seek the truth, and we're better off for knowing the truth. But there are some theological things that people have argued about for 2,000 years. No one's come to a conclusion yet, so I don't think I'm going to come to one either. So, yeah, um, especially when it comes to eschatology. I, I've had people get mad at me because I won't tell them my view of eschatology. It's like, well, it's kind of hard to explain because... Because of what I know and what I've been through and what I've studied and everything I've learned, you know, so. But, you know, yeah. Yeah. Jesus could have very well said, you know what? I never lusted after a woman. I never took anything that wasn't mine. I always put God first in everything I did. You know, you could say I've never coveted my neighbor's stuff. You know, I never killed anyone. I don't have to go to that cross, but he did. Yeah, and there's a major work coming up here in a little bit. It has to do with obedience. Yeah, we'll get to that here in a second. All right, so he did not take advantage of being in God's nature. What is that? It means he had the right to say, you know what? Let's just call 12 legions of angels and call it a day. He didn't seize on his advantage of being God, which he was equal to, you guys saw that word, to that which he, he was to have, to that which he was, was to have. So, yeah, he was equal to the Father God, right? And also the Spirit's there, but, you know, the Spirit's not being brought up in this right now. But, yes, he was the second... He is, he is, he, he never ceased to be. I'm going to talk to you guys about a, a belief that, that I don't go for here in a little bit. He was always divine. He was always God. He was equal to the Father God. So did he have to do this for us? No, he did not. This sets us up that he will empty himself to show the way of the cross and discipleship. Now, um, I've been in some theological conversations in Bible college. And uh, the, 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 the rule in discussing things with your professor, and all, the, all my professors were this way. They were all this way. They respected you for what you knew. And, uh, but they said that if, um, they said, you know, if, if I teach you something and you... Um, 
don't agree. If you can't back up with what you believe with Scripture, then I won't consider what you're saying. But if you can, I'll listen to you. And I was like, you know, that would save a lot of time. Because what are we here to do? Discuss the Bible. So if you can't back your point up, how about you humble yourself, pipe down, listen, and later on when you've become just as educated or you've been educated a bit, you can form your own opinion on this, whatever it is. But yeah, the way of the cross. Have you ever had to die to yourself? Is that easy? Yeah. Yeah. It was like it goes right back to the right of give it up being right. You're just like, okay. I'll just shut up and pray for this person. They don't know what they're talking about. So yeah. All right, here it is. Here's the big verb. And the reason why I say this is a big verb is because there is so much discussion on what did what does Paul in this poem mean right here? But he made himself of no reputation. We'll get back to that. Taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. All right, here it is. But making himself of no reputation. Literally, that verb means emptied. And it's called, I think it's kenosis. I think that's the how you pronounce it. Kenosis? Yeah, kenosis. It's a verb. It's aorist and it's active. So it happened. Jesus did empty himself. We'll come back. Well, you know what? Let, let me just go ahead and tell you this because I didn't put it in the notes. Some people believe, and oddly enough, it's not considered a heresy. And to me, it borders one. Some people in Christianity believe that Jesus became the Son of God when he was baptized by the Holy Spirit. And then when he went to the cross, he emptied himself of his divinity and just died like a man being a sacrifice. And then because he did all that, the Father restored him using this same passage and gave him the name above every name, and now he has the right to be the Son of God. I don't go for that. I believe he was the Son of God before he became the incarnate. And I believe he was the Son of God on the cross. And I believe he was the Son of God when he rose from the dead. And I believe he's still the Son of God at the right hand of the Father. But there are some people, and they're, they're considered Christians because they still hold to the, to the deity of who he is. They just believe that he was born. He wasn't born divine, but he became divine so he could do the perfect, live the perfect life at his baptism. Now think about that. Have you done any sins before you became 30? <laughs> okay. All right. Whatever. By the way, there's people even in our own denomination who believe this. And they can fellowship with us because they believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be empowered. It's not considered a heresy. But I don't go for it. Anyways, so that word, that word is, is a big word with some people. All right. Emptied himself. We'll talk about what empty means. Here we go. Or made himself with no reputation, taking or taking on. It's a participle. It's aorist and active. That means it happened. Um, taking the form of or being born. Merry Christmas, right? That's a participle. It's also aorist, so it just means it happened, take it as a past tense. But now it's in the middle voice. Look at that. That popped up again. You know what Jesus did? He decided to come down and be a helpless baby. Think about that. Merry Christmas. Amen. Oh, holy night and silent night. There you go. All right. Here we go. Um, of a bond servant and coming or being found. It's a participle. It's, 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 it's heiress, but now it's passive. So he was discovered. Well, did people discover Jesus when he started preaching? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was, that happened to him. All right, so there's all the action words. So here we go. He making himself of no reputation, or the, king, or the, or the NIV says making himself nothing, 
or as this verb reads, he emptied himself. That is a direct translation. That's, yeah, he emptied himself. All right. To be self-giving for the sake of others. All right. I ran out of room, but if you go back to verse 29, what does it say? For you, for you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, every year we end up in this room at this time, and we always talk about the cross. And I always think it's funny because I'm sitting here eating a cookie and drinking coffee, and here's me suffering for Christ. <laughs> but we always come to that point. Well, that's, that's the big point of the New Testament. So suffering for Christ right now is, is it's, it's not, not as bad as it is today. All right. Today is not as bad as it can be. All right. So, yes, giving for the sake of others. All right, if you ever do ministry, you'll learn all about that. This is the contrast of verse 3 in having that, that I told you it was coming up, empty glory. Did he already have glory? Did he have the right to not go to the cross? Was he equal with God and didn't have to do this? Yeah. A.K.A. conceit back in verse 3. And it has to do with being poured out as seen on the cross. And this goes with the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, verse 12. So here we go. Isaiah 53, verse 12, says, Therefore I will divide him with the portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with, with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. Well, there you go. How did he empty himself? He let go what he had the right not to do. That's what that verb's getting at, and I totally agree with the scholar. He was numbered with the transgressors. You guys ever see images of three crosses? He, was, he bore the sins of many and made intersection intercession for the transgressor now keep your finger in that because we're going to go right back to that hymn or right, right back to that uh, passage all right to be exalted by god which is which is seen in this in this hymn as well as the suffering servant passage so now go to 52 52 is where it actually starts in 50 uh, 52 13 and uh, this is where this passage actually starts, the suffering servant. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Well, what's the end of this uh, passage that we're going to look at next time? Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that every name of Jesus, every knee should bow, uh, those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father to the God, to God the Father. So there you go. He emptied himself of the right to be right, the right to, to seize and take advantage of his position. All right, that's very key. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Paul makes this point elsewhere by saying he became poor. Here's another simple way of saying it. And this is a, you guys know that this is a, one of the scriptures I use when we take up offering. Um, if I can get back to it. Yeah. Um, 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yeah, he had all of heaven. He didn't have to do any of this, right? He didn't have to be born in a barn, right? He didn't have to be born in the dirt of this earth. Yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty might become rich. Now, the reason why the scholar says that's saying the same thing is because you guys realize that when you get crucified on a Roman cross, they strip you of everything. I mean, there's no other way to be poverty-stricken, to be uh, crucified without anything and needing medical attention. And you're just supposed to hang there for three days and die. I mean, that's I don't know how more poverty-stricken you can get. So that can uh, reverse any curse of sin. Amen? Amen. All right. So he became poor, is how another way to put it. And being a bondservant is the focus of Paul as he gives the gospel instruction on how to live out the message of the gospel. So check this out. Go back to the very beginning. Paul and Timothy, 
bond servants. You notice that Paul never says, I am the apostle Paul. He always says, I am a servant of God called to be an apostle. You know, like I when, like when people, you know, say, well, you know, you got the title pastors. I said, yeah, I'm called to be that. That will buy me anything. Yeah. Except for a free meal tomorrow. Tomorrow buys me a free meal. That's cool. All right. I get to go to a banquet and they feed me, which is awesome. All right. And I'll thank God because I know where all the provisions come. And here's another, here's another little interesting thing. Read Galatians uh, 5.13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, but don't use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, though, but through love serve one another. What is that saying? You have the right not to care about anybody. But as a Christian, you should. <laughs> Why? Because Jesus did that for you on the cross. There it is. So, all right. Jesus does not come into humanity as Lord with the advantages of that. He is Lord. He was Lord when he came, came to us, but he didn't come with that advantage. He didn't come in a robe and riding on a horse and lightning shooting out his eyes and all the stuff you see in Revelation. That will happen, but he didn't come that way. But as a servant, in his godly character and example. So there you go. God had the right to show up and prove everyone, hey, I'm God. But you know what? He came in the appearance of a man, and no one ever knew who he was until he started ministering. All right. He came in the likeness of man, meaning that he was still God and equal. Verse 6 right there, that's where I tell you this passage people use for that other belief but you can see it right there back in verse 6 in his pre-existent he was what equal with god and he was a man who lived out a human life in that likeness all right so and i threw this in here fee didn't say this but i thought i'd throw this in here this is a uh, this you'll hear preachers say this some say he was a hundred percent god and a hundred percent man as the incarnate he was the only two hundred he was the only 200 percenter that ever ever existed. Yeah, he was 100 percent God and 100 percent man. The church is a people made in the likeness of God, right? We're all made in His image, and can live out His characteristics of God by having His mindset. So that sums up this whole little section right here. All right, verse eight. Now, verse eight, uh, Fee titles this one by itself as a subsection. As a man, he humbled himself. So here we go. Oh, I'm still in Galatians. That ain't going to help me. That ain't going to help me study Philippians. All right. Well, it won't help me read Philippians. All right. Being in the found of the parents, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of, of the cross. So here we go. And being found in the parents of a man, he humbled. He humbled as a verb, as heiress, and as active. So, yeah, it happened. Uh, himself and became. Became is the next action word. It's a participle. It's heiress again because he did, he did this. He went to the cross. But now it's in the middle voice, meaning that he did it to himself, right? He did it, you could say, for himself, or he did it for us. He allowed it to happen to him. Well, that's more of a passive voice, but anyways, yeah. Here we go. This is, all right, yeah. He came in the model, or you could say how, mo, uh, mode of existence. That's how Fee likes to say it. Or you could simply use the word, like the King James, in the appearance <laughs> of a human, which does have to do with his external look now that is recognizable. All right, so... He didn't come in, he didn't show up as God saying, look at me. He showed up in, as a man. And you looked at him and you could see that he was a man. It was recognizable that this guy's a man, right? Yeah, well, he was more than a man, but you get, you, you get what it's getting at. So this now has to do with external. Because back when, when he was a spirit, when he was um, the pre-incarnate, um, he didn't have a body. But now he does. 
And he still does. You guys know that? Yeah, he still does. Yeah. Yeah, Nels, yeah the, the only man-made thing in heaven is the scars on Jesus. Yeah. All right. So now he's recognizable as a man, and this existent and this uh, existence was was seen when he humbled himself. That contrasts again selfishness and conceit. Back in verse three, why was verse three important? Because Paul said, "This is what you do. Look at the example of Jesus. Don't be selfish and don't have empty glory. Yeah, don't grasp. Oh, by the way, taking advantage of his nature." Some people translate that grasp at. He could have grasped it. He could have had it. But, but uh, emptying, let go. He let go of it. That's another way to look at that. So anyways. All right. For the equal advantage he had, right? He, ha- he still had that. To the, to the, yeah. So this whole thing covers, he became a man, contrast again to the selfishness and conceit that he, he left the glory. And conceit means empty glory. For the advantage he had, to the exaltation to the highest place when we get to verse 9 next time we we meet. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. So that's what this that's what this verse is doing. It's transitioning us from the cross to what? The exaltation for doing this. All right. And again, was his glory empty and vain? No, it wasn't. He already had it. So the way he humbled himself was by obedience. Now, there you go. There's a word for uh, discipleship. Have you ever done something for God that you just did not want to do, but you did it anyways? Have you ever done something for God, and you knew it wasn't going to be good, and you did it, and it wasn't good, but later on you were blessed? That happened to me. One day I had a conversation with God. I said, do you realize how much money I have in my bank? And God's like, yeah, of course he knows. <laughs> and uh, I end up helping a person out. And by the way, I knew that money would never come back to me and it never did. But then the next day I got online to pay off one of my student, lo- pay all my student loans. And I didn't realize, but it was already paid off. I was, I was, I, I was done. I didn't have to pull, put the full payment on to, to end it. I was like, well, praise Jesus. There you go. I was blessed for just being obedient. All right. And that speaks to the request of Paul to the Philippians. What is he wanting them to do? Get along with each other. We've already read it in verse 2 through 4. You know, fulfill my joy by getting along, having love in the same mind, right? Don't do everything out of selfishness, but, you know, esteem everyone better and look out for the interests of everyone else. Then it goes right into the passage. Have this mind that was in you, that was in Christ, that took him to the cross. All right. All right, and it was by taking the lowest place one could do, and that was the death on a cross. That is the lowest place in humanity anybody could go in this time, was to go to a cross. You know, um, yeah, it's in the notes, I'll tell you why. The one equal with God went to the place, to a place of, of, uh, a place d- disobedient slaves or an insurrectionist punishment of right if you uh came against rome you're going to end up on a cross if you're a disobedient slave you're going to end up on a cross yeah so it was the lowest punishment it was the lowest place to end up for capital punishment. Yeah. And this is where uh, people talk about the scandal of the cross. It's a scandal because the God of glory went there when the God of glory didn't have to. Yeah. So here we go. The punishment of death by Rome, right? Rome, Rome would do this. They're the ones invented the, the crucifixion which was a scandalous thing for people in this time because it says that even Lord Caesar is not Lord of all. Why? Because Caesar would never humble himself to this point, would he? No emperor would ever do this. 
since he would not subject himself by the hands of his enemies. And also, uh, Fee talked about this. You know, you think, you think Lord Caesar would go, you know what, I'll let my, um, my, uh, uh, my proconsul uh, come to me and set me in a thing uh, in, in in a court setting, and let the I'll let the, I'll allow them to accuse me to come to a truth and a verdict. You think Caesar would allow that? But you realize the Son of God did that. He allowed himself to be in what we would call today a kangaroo court. Yeah, and it's funny, the word insurrection and kangaroo courts are show trials is a as is a thing today, isn't it? Yeah. I won't go any further into that, but it is. <laughs> but do you realize that Jesus knew it was fixed and he went into it? Again, do you think Lord Caesar would have done that? Did he have power to grasp to make that not happen? Yeah, he was Caesar. Forget you. I'm going to put you on a cross next. You asked me to do that again, or I'll probably go ahead and just do it, you know. Oh, you want you want to accuse me of something? Well, see that cross? Roman soldiers put him on that cross over there. Yeah, there we go. Done with that. That was fun. All right, so now here's a really cool note to end this with. Our scholar says that there's evidence that Paul added even the death of the cross to this hymn. Now, you can kind of see this. Look, look, at, look at it again. And he was found in appearance as a man. He became, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. So, in poetry, that would just kind of, you can kind of see how that would flow. But do you see that he, you get a comma there, even the death of the cross. Now, he didn't have to say death twice, but he ended up saying death twice there. So that's why they think that Paul added this in. So what's Paul emphasizing? Jesus died not just on a... Jesus didn't just take on capital punishment. He took on this for all of us to be the ultimate example, which was the death on a Roman death rack for disobedient slaves and insurrectionists. So we can be saved. So we can be sanctified by his blood. Amen? Amen. So there you go. There's the example of Christ. We'll let you go.